Okay, it's break month. I'm bored. Let's do a tier list. So today we're going to be ranking all the Conqueror's Haki users in one piece. And we're going to be ranking them according to three criteria. The first is embodiment. And by this, I mean how kingly they are or how much they embody the will and the spirit of a ruler. The second is strength, how physically strong they are in combat, particularly in their use of Conqueror's Haki, but also overall. Because in order to be a conqueror and to be a king, you need to be strong enough to make sure that you will overcome whatever challenge challenges you face. And finally, the last criteria is feats, which I hope is pretty self-explanatory, but we're pretty much assessing them on what they've achieved so far in the story. And without much further ado, let's start with Goldie Roger. So, in terms of embodiment, Roger is literally the pirate king. He's the king of all the seas, he achieved the peak of piracy, captain of one of the most legendary crews, found the One Piece, kickstarted the golden age of piracy, he was at the top of all of his contemporaries, Roger is literally used as the measuring stick. He's the benchmark to be compared against in terms of the standard of strength and power. So in terms of embodiment, I think it's pretty fair to say that Roger definitely embodies that kingly status and kingly being. How about strength? We haven't seen him fight all that much, but whenever we do see him or whatever we hear about him, he's only talked about or he's only shown as being a dominant force. We also did see him use advanced Conqueror's Haki in that sky-splitting clash against Whitebeard. And again, he just sets the standard of what is strength. All the other top tier combatants like Whitebeard, such as Garb, we know them to be strong because they're compared to against Roger. And then in terms of feats, he was the Pirate King, found the One Piece, started the Golden Age of Piracy, enough said. I think it's pretty uncontroversial to say that Roger is at S tier. Moving on to his right hand man, Rayleigh. Okay, so in terms of embodiment, I think Rayleigh is definitely someone who could be a ruler and leader in their own right if he wanted to. But he hasn't been shown to be necessarily ambitious. But still, he was the right-hand man to the Pirate King, enough for Roger to call him partner, who's known as the Dark King, which is an indication that his kingly status and kingly will was recognized. And I think this is important here. He was able to seduce the Empress, Empress, the Empress, sorry, I can't roll my R's, the Empress of the Kuja Pirates. So this does indicate that he definitely does have dominating will. And now if we move on to strength, Shaki might have just been tooting her own husband's horn, if you know what I mean. But Rayleigh was said to be a hundred times stronger than any of the supernova. At Sabori, we saw him fend off Kizaru with pretty much little difficulty. His strength was recognized by Garp, Blackbeard, and whatever it is, Rayleigh has indicated incredible strength. Just in general, in terms of his speed and his stamina, as well as his swordsmanship. But we also know he is extremely proficient in his use of Haki. He definitely has advanced Conqueror's Haki, and even more than that, he has such mastery and skill over his use of Haki. And then in terms of feats, Rayleigh was the right-hand man of the Pirate King, so he was right there alongside Roger when they discovered the One Piece. I'm sure Roger would say that he wouldn't have been able to do it without the likes of Rayleigh. And he still also remains an incredible threat even in his old age. Enough for Blackbeard to run away. He also trained Luffy and he molded Luffy into becoming the fighter that we know him to be today, especially in his use of Haki. And I'm gonna say this again. I think charming your way into the heart of of a Kuja tribe empress. I think that's a definite feat. So Rayleigh, we're gonna give him a plus, right on the cusp of S tier. So we've mentioned Kuja tribe quite a bit now, so let's move on to Boa Hancock, one of the very few female Conqueror Haki users in the series. So in terms of embodiment, she is an empress of the legendary all-female Kuja tribe. She definitely embodies the fierce and dominant qualities of a leader. She just oozes confidence. Even when Kobe offered her to turn herself in to save the rest of the tribe, Boa refused, indicating that she will never bend again to ever become imprisoned again. Or even when she was being choked by Blackbeard to death, she was unyielding and would have rather died than submit to his demands. So big points for Boa there. But then we also have to take into account that she did actually submit to the will of the world government somewhat by becoming one of the Shichibukai in the first place. On one hand, that could be seen as a wise decision for her to make to save and protect her people. But on the other hand, it's just not something 
that someone like, say, Luffy as the poster child for the indomitable spirit. If Luffy was faced with a choice of we are going to attack and kill your people if you don't join us and work for us or work with us, Luffy, for better or for worse, would probably say, screw that, I'll just fight you all, I'll win so that you can't hurt my people. And then speaking of Luffy, Boa also uses her composure whenever it comes to Luffy, her queenly demeanor, and she's even made an exception to her otherwise hatred for men. In terms of strength, as the head of the Amazon Lily tribe, she really is a very impressive warrior. We know that she's actually the strongest of the Kuja tribe. She's incredibly skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat, especially when it comes to her kicks. That's not a kick. That's a kick. Particularly making use of her very long legs. And on that note, she really knows how to use her devil fruit and her beauty to her advantage. She's also another one of those very rare individuals throughout the series who has all three forms of haki. But, but in saying that, we actually haven't seen her use Conqueror's haki, so we can't really assess that aspect more thoroughly. In terms of feats, she became the empress of the Kujo tribe at just 18 years old, which is super, super young. And she was also invited to be one of the warlords, which I think in and of itself is a very big achievement. So putting that all together, I think Bawa deserves a C. Next up, looking at another former warlord is Doflamingo. Embodiment. Doflamingo definitely has the will of a conqueror. He definitely wants to rule. And he is also by blood a world noble. So that element of royalty and conquestorial nature is quite literally biologically ingrained in him. In fact, it is so a part of him that he detested, absolutely hated no longer being noble. And so you can see that kingly nature is really, really an innate part of who Doflamingo is as a person. And so through and through, this will of a ruler is definitely within Doflamingo. Not the same sort of benevolent ruler that we see in some of the other Conqueror Haki users, but in that more traditional, very aggressive conquest style of a leader. And then even on top of that, he still does or did inspire certain people to follow him and actually feel loyalty to him. But then in saying all of that, I think it is important to recognize that he isn't immune to feeling fear or he's not above submitting himself under others because we clearly saw that Doflamingo was quite scared of Kaido and willing to put himself under Kaido's will. In terms of strength, I mean Doflamingo is a very skilled fighter. He possesses really incredible strength even without making use of his devil fruit or haki. But then he has also mastered his devil fruit, being one of the first awakened devil fruit users that we've seen in the series. And he is also capable of using all three forms of haki. Doflamingo is actually an example of one of those monsters who unleashed their conqueror's haki as just a kid. I think he was around 10 years old, but we haven't actually seen him use advanced Conqueror's Haki. All in all, I think it's pretty hard to deny that Doflamingo is a very strong fighter. He was really the first major threat that we saw in the post time skip era in the New World, forced Luffy to go to Gear 4, which is a form that we hadn't seen prior to Luffy fighting Doflamingo. And yeah, Doflamingo lost, but that was against the tag team between Law and Luffy, whilst Doflamingo was also using his Devil Fruit to instill that birdcage and he pretty much wrecked Law. And then if we look at feats, he was one of the Shichibukai. He awakened his Devil Fruit power, awakened his Conqueror's Haki at a young age. All in all, he's very resourceful, knows how to mix his brains and his strength to have achieved his rule over Dressrosa to achieve his goal or his ambitions. So I think Doflamingo sits at a very healthy B. Next up, Odin. In terms of embodiment, he was a Damio, so really a ruler and a leader. And actually on that note, he was a leader in a very similar way to how, say, Luffy is a leader. He inspires followers even when he doesn't necessarily want them. You know, we see him begrudgingly become the leader of a lot of ruffians and ragtag group of people. In saying that, I think it is important to mention that he did, however, have some character flaws that make him fall short of becoming the pinnacle of a wise and an overall perceptive ruler. You know, he didn't deal with Orochi before he left Wano. He trusted Orochi and submitted himself to humiliation instead of saying, I'm just gonna beat you both here and now so that you guys can't hurt my people ever again. But overall, it is hard to deny that Odin does definitely embody that spirit and will of a king or of a ruler. Maybe the other thing, however, is that he doesn't necessarily have ambition or not ambition to become a king. He wanted adventure and then ultimately he also did accept the responsibility of a ruler. But he didn't have these ambitions ambitions to become a pirate king or to become the shogun of Wano. But I suppose that has more to do with his personal history and probably the fact that that was something always expected of him.
So his goals were just skewed a little bit differently. And he did achieve those goals as well. In terms of strength, that's an easy one. Strong, like Hercules level strong, god tier strong from a very young age. He was one of the very few people able to fight Kaido. He left a scar, a deep scar that no one was able to match for another, you know, 20 years or so. He also had the upper hand in the fight against Kaido. Arguably, Odin would have won if it wasn't for that dirty trick. So strength-wise, no-brainer. Feats, again, he scarred Kaido. He became the Daimyo, even if he didn't become the Shogun. And he also became Whitebeard's commander. He saved all of his scabbards while he was burning in a pot of boiling oil. And we also have to mention his swordsmanship skills, which we know to be a very difficult task. Enmar is a notoriously unruly sword. I think the only knack against Odin would be that he didn't manage to turn Enmar into a black blade, but I think that's only because Odin had an untimely early death, and so he wasn't able to reach his full potential when it came to using Enmar. So overall, I think that places Odin very high in this tier list, and I think we're gonna give him A tier. He's very comfortably in the A tier. Next, we're gonna look at Odin's number one fan, Yamato. In terms of embodiment, this is a bit difficult. I think Yamato really started coming into themselves by the end of Wano, but we didn't really see that throughout the entirety of Wano or throughout the entirety of Act 3 or whenever Yamato showed up. Staying behind to protect Wano, I think that is a very wise, honorable decision that is very fitting for a ruler. And we also did see that throughout Yamato's childhood, Yamato did maintain that spirit of defiance against Kaido. In terms of strength, Yamato held their own against Kaido, which is a very impressive feat. Yamato also has a strength that was recognized by Kaido, Ace, and Luffy alike. Also has advanced Conqueror's Haki, which I think automatically bumps you up in terms of strength to those higher tiers. But then strangely, Yamato hasn't achieved advanced armament Haki to free themselves of their own chains. And although advanced armament Haki or Ryo and advanced Conqueror's Haki are completely different abilities, I do think that in order to be a ruler or to stand at the top of your peers as a conqueror or as a king, I do think you need to have a comparable high level of skill across all areas. And to that point, Yamato has an awakened devil fruit, which I do think is an indicator of immense skill and strength. And Yamato was also quite proficient in their use of their awakened devil fruit. In terms of feats, again, because of the nature of Yamato's story, I don't think we can say that they've achieved as many feats per se as some of these other conqueror haki users, but extremely helpful during Wano, helped fend off an admiral, which I don't think we should take lightly because we know how strong admirals themselves are, awakened Conqueror's Haki at a very young age, which is very impressive, and is now probably the top tier number one defender and protector of Wano. So I think in terms of overall ranking, Yamato deserves a comfortable B tier. Now we're gonna look at Yamato's friend Ace. Ace is a fun one. In terms of embodiment, Ace was quite lost throughout a lot of his life, so I don't think he ever really fully stepped into his own. And even though he did display the confidence and the self-assurance of a good conqueror, of a good leader and a king, he also made a lot of foolish decisions that are unfitting of a wise ruler. But then in saying that he was a captain of his own crew, he did become a Yonko commander despite being very young. So he was in these leadership positions and he had a lot of potential to live up to a lot of them. And I think that's really the point. He had a lot of potential but didn't get the chance to quite live up to it. And a lot of that is also his own fault. In terms of his strength, it's hard to dispute. We know that he was defeating adults with little difficulty from a young age, had Conqueror's Haki from a young age. We don't know whether he had advanced Conqueror's Haki though, because that really wasn't present during pre-time skip era. And we didn't really get to see him use Conqueror's Haki all that much, except when he was younger against Blue Jam. But we do know that he was very strong. He lasted five days in a fight against Jinbei. Blackbeard wanted him in his crew because of his strength, recognizing that none of his own crew could fight Ace during that time. And Ace was also invited to be one of the Shichibukai because of the Marines and the world government also recognized his strength. So again, he had immense potential to go even higher if it wasn't for his early death. In terms of feats, he became the second commander of an almighty Yonko crew. He had a super high bounty of like 550 million berry. Again, he was invited to be one of the Shichibukai. So really, to sum up Ace, overall comes down to loads and loads of potential, but falls short of reaching those top tiers, although he probably would have most definitely been at those top tiers if his story continued throughout the series. But with what we have so far, we are going to have to place him at... I want 
gonna say B. Maybe B minus. Let's stick him at B. Next up is Ace's daddy, Whitebeard. Embodiment. Whitebeard wasn't the Pirate King, but that was only because he didn't want it. He didn't desire it. He didn't have the same sort of kingly ambitions, but he did definitely have noble leadership qualities and ambitions to become a father and achieve a family, which he did fulfill. And in that way, he does definitely embody the fatherly qualities of a ruler. You know, he demonstrates those aspects of protection and unconditional love, which is more than what I can say about my own father. Just kidding, Dad. I love you. The only thing that I would say maybe against Whitebeard is that he did follow Rox. And yeah, to be fair, we don't know the circumstances of how and why he was following Rox Dizabek. But from what we do know, it does seem like Whitebeard and Rox's ideals and values clash. And so regardless of whether Rox was as evil as the world government claimed, we do know that he was keen on becoming a conqueror. And for the likes of Garp and Roger to oppose him, there must be at least some truth, at least some truth that Rox isn't this hero of the people. Whereas with Whitebeard, we know that he was a protector of the people, particularly those who are disadvantaged and powerless. So for a figure like Whitebeard with all of his values and ideals, for him to follow Rox, I don't know, you just have to say that it doesn't seem very kingly to submit under someone that you don't necessarily share the same values with. But in every other aspect, I think it's hard to deny that Whitebeard does definitely demonstrate those dominating will and quality. In terms of strength, that's an easy one. Strongest man in the world. He went toe-to-toe -to -toe against Roger, and so we can safely assume that whatever Roger was able to achieve in terms of his strength, Whitebeard was able to do so as well. We only need to take a page out of Marineford, everything that he managed to do at Marineford, despite the fact that he was sick and old and ill. Strength is really a no-brainer. And then again with feats, it's a bit of a special case because Whitebeard, we don't see as many of his feats on screen, and because of the the very nature of his dream, he doesn't necessarily achieve the same feats in the traditional sense. But I do think you should count his feats at Marineford. I do think we should count him achieving his dream in becoming a proud father. I think that is an achievement. He was also the strongest man in the world, even without necessarily trying to achieve some sort of legendary status. He kickstarted the second age of piracy. He was known as the man closest to the One Piece, was a Yonko. Overall, I think Whitebeard just falls off the cusp of an S tier. Gonna give him an A+. Plus. A++++. Plus 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 plus. Just outside S tier. Continuing on with the old timers of One Piece. Now looking at Monkey D. Garp. In terms of embodiment, I think Garp really demonstrates his kingly will and that dominating force by refusing to bend his morals or values against his higher-ups. Garp clearly does what he wants. You know, he refuses to become an admiral despite the pressure because he really doesn't want to work under the Celestial Dragons. He also openly disrespects them, and then the world nobles are almost too scared to take action against him, which I think is truly very kingly, no fucks given behavior. Garp is also another one of those individuals that inspires followers. You know, for example, Aokiji is his fanboy, and then also more widely because he's the hero of the marines. In terms of strength, I think that's also very clear. Went toe-to-toe -to -toe against the pirate king, Roger recognized his strength as a worthy opponent, and then even at his old age, we see Garp capable of fighting the likes of Kuzan, who is a former admiral. You know, old man still packs a punch, like literally a galaxy-sized punch. And the fact that he's able to compete in this world with legendary devil fruit wielding monsters with just his fists, I think that's a crazy feat. Also more recently, probably some of the most coolest uses of the advanced conquerors haki that we've seen in actual combat. You know, the way that he actually incorporates it as part of his moves, as part of his attack repertoire to boost the magnitude of the impact of his attacks. In terms of feats, he's a marine hero, he's the rival of Roger, he's fit to be of admiral rank, probably even higher if it wasn't for the fact that he refused, took down Roxy Zebek alongside Roger, who was one of the most fearsome pirates in the world. I think overall, we have to give Garb an S. Moving on to the next grand daddy of One Piece, Grand Daddy Chin Zhao. Embodiment, he was the leader of the fearsome and, you know, the massive Hapo Navy. And 
And we've also seen that in terms of personality, he can be quite composed as well as brutal in combat when he needs to be. And so I think that does indicate the nuance in qualities that you need as a leader. But then on the other hand, I think there's quite a bit of a contradiction in his level of perception. In some ways, he's shown as being quite perceptive in that he was able to see through Luffy's disguise when no one else could. But then he also overestimates his own strength and capabilities. You know, he did this against Garp and then he did that again with Luffy. And speaking of Garp, when Garp broke his pointed head, which was his pride and joy, Chin Jiao lost his will and his motivation. You know, he fell into quite a depressive state. And I do think that having your will broken when you face a challenge and adversity and falling into that hole rather than picking yourself up and bouncing back up. I do think that means he does lose some points when it comes to his embodiment of a ruler, of a king, of this grand conqueror. In terms of strength, he is another one of those all three forms of Haki users. We know that Garp had to undergo incredible training to fight Chin Jiao, you know, fighting literal mountains because that's how strong Chin Jiao's head is, which I think says a lot because hello, it's Garp. And during his prime, they did actually say that he was the rival of both Garp and Roger, which I think speaks volumes. And then we did see that once his pointed head was restored, a lot of his original power returned as well. In terms of feats, being a relatively minor character in the series, we don't really get to see all that much in terms of feats, but, but then being strong enough to be deemed Garp and Roger's rival, I do think that that is quite the achievement. So, all up, we are going to put Chin Jiao at C. Okay, next, another old timer. We have Sengoku. Sengoku clearly has the qualities of a leader when it comes to embodiment of a ruler or of a king. Uh, he was the fleet admiral and we have seen him to be quite the dominating force when he needs to be or when he wants to be. He doesn't necessarily seem to possess this idea of kingly ambition, but he does possess other kingly or leadership qualities, you know, especially when it comes to his uh, perception. He's quite astute and wise. But I also do have to point out that by the end of his reign as fleet admiral, he did face some conflict when it came to his morals and his values versus his honor and duty to the world government. You know, when the world government wanted to cover up the Impel Down incident, despite what it would mean for ordinary citizens, this is really what caused Sengoku to lose a lot of faith and played a huge role in him stepping down as fleet admiral. And again, this is why I go back to the contrast between someone like Garp, who I think perfectly embodies that spirit, unyielding in terms of not wanting to bend down to anybody if it means that it would conflict with his own ideals and values, to what happened to Sengoku. And then speaking of Garp, uh, Sengoku also demonstrates quite a lot of frustration at Garp, but then because of his friendship, can't do anything about it. And in that way, he's a lot more led by Garp rather than enforcing and imposing his own dominance or his own will. In terms of strength, Sengoku was the only other marine that Roger recognized as being worthy of his time. He's got that Buddha mythical Zoan devil fruit, which gives him incredible force. And even without it, we did see that he was able to pin down Garp. Now granted, Garp allowed him to do so, but if it was anyone else who didn't have the strength to actually hold Garp down, I do think that in that current state, Garp was so angry that he probably would have broken through anyone if they weren't at least able to hold him down the same way that Sengoku was able to. We also know that he does have all three forms of Haki, just haven't seen him use it all that yet. And then in terms of his feats, he was the fleet admiral, which means that he reached, you know, the one of the highest positions in the marines. We also know that he was able to subdue Shiki, who's also a fearsome combatant. And he's also recognized and well known for being a tactical and um, strategy genius. So I think on balance, Sengoku deserves a high B. And now, moving away from granddaddies to grandmommies. Mommy? Grandmommy. Alright, <laughs> Big Mom. So in terms of embodiment, Big Mom also definitely has, you know, kingly, queenly ambitions. She is the only female Yonko. She's also quite savvy and knows how to achieve what she wants, whether that be through coercion and force or via political arrangements. You know, she's amassed this incredibly vast and huge crew and she does what she wants to get what she wants. I do think we have to take into consideration though that her mental state, she isn't quite mature or hasn't grown up fully yet. You know, her arrogance often gets in the way and so she can be quite oblivious to situations when she might be in danger or when her kids might be in danger. And so in terms of overall the balance of qualities that you do need as a ruler, I think Big Mom does fall short. But then when it comes 
comes to strength, physical strength alone, it's really hard to fault Big Mom. She's an absolute monster, has been from a very young age. She has all three forms of Haki, including Advanced Conqueror's Haki, and that's on top of just her base natural strength. And then even her use of Haki is so strong that Law said that he can't just move her around in his room because her Haki is too strong. In terms of feats, the number of kingdoms and the number of groups and individuals that she's been able to subdue under her will is a terrifying, very impressive amount. Her standing as the only female Yonko, the fact that she was a part of the Rocks Pirates, again a very legendary crew, made up with only the top of the top, the creme de la creme. And she did stand on equal footing with some of the other legendary figures in the series, even if Kaido didn't recognize her too. So really, putting all of those together, I think Big Mom is a fearsome A-tier Conqueror's Haki user. Looking at Big Mom's child, Katakuri. If we're thinking about embodiment, Katakuri definitely has the qualities of a leader, even if he doesn't necessarily have the ambitions to necessarily become a king or a ruler. But he does have very noble qualities and ambitions. You know, he wants to protect his family. And he definitely feels the great pressure as well as pride of being the strongest in Big Mom's crew. And then in this way, he's actually happy to submit himself under Big Mom, despite the fact that she doesn't treat him as well as she should. And then also interestingly, it seems like despite his loyalty towards her, because we do know that Katakuri is quite loyal to Big Mom, there is a bit of an inconsistency in how he doesn't commit to stopping Luffy from ever coming back to attack Big Mom again. You know, he encourages Luffy and wishes him luck on his journey to come take away Big Mom's throne. So maybe we should just lump this all together and say that Katakuri has mummy issues. Or if it's not mummy issues, he's definitely emotionally scarred. That is undoubtable. You know, Katakuri never got over having to be perfect in protecting his family. You know, he blames himself for what happened to Brulee. And so in that sense, it's hard to say that Katakuri has reached, you know, 100% enlightenment or assurance in himself or that confidence, peak confidence and assurance that you need to be a supreme ruler. You know, you'd argue that's a huge part of why he lost against Luffy. In terms of strength, however, he is very, very formidable. You know, Big Mom's top combatant. He possesses all three forms of Haki, although we haven't seen him use advanced Conqueror's Haki, but we do know that he is an absolute monster in his mastery of observation Haki. And his advanced observation Haki gives him an incredibly advantage in combat situations. And that's also alongside his awakened form of a devil fruit, again, indicating that he is very, very skilled when it comes to combat. In terms of his feats, he easily defeated Ichiji despite Ichiji being a Germa modified soldier. The fact that he has both awakened his devil fruit and achieved advanced observation Haki, a very notable feat. And he is the top commander of a very, you know, very fearsome Yonko crew. So I think Katakuri is well placed at B. Next up is Kid. Kid definitely has the ambitions of a king. Definitely has kingly ambitions. You know, he dreams high. He aims very high. Does he have all the other qualities that makes him fit to say that he embodies those kingly qualities? I don't know. I do have to say that I think he overestimates himself. He overestimates himself and his capabilities time and time again. And because of this, he makes foolish decisions that are not befitting of a ruler or a wise king. You know, why? Why did you decide to take on the Red Hair Pirates, one of the most balanced Yonko crews in their own territory, home base? And then he didn't back down again when it came to facing Kaido. And then he tried to take on Shanks. Again, Shanks, Red Hair Shanks. You already lost to his crew. It's like he got super confident after what happened at Wano against Big Mom. Although, let's be honest, Law helped out quite a bit. And then just didn't learn from what happened last time. And so I guess this brings us to strength, we have to pay respect to the fact that he has awakened his devil fruit, even if he hasn't mastered it yet, and so it does take a serious toll on his body. The fact that he was able to master and awaken his devil fruit, that does say a lot. And he is also another one of those people who can use all three forms of Haki, but we haven't really seen him use Conqueror's Haki. Kid definitely has a lot of potential, and he is high up in terms of the rest of the One Piece world. But if we're looking at it from the top of the top, his strength just does doesn't match, doesn't quite match his huge great ambitions for himself. Or maybe what we can say is that what Kid has lacked the most is that he's lacked luck. You know, it's really bad luck that the first person that he faced after Wano was 
milkshakes. But that's his own damn fault. You know, why go via that route? In terms of feats, his most notable one has to be bringing down Big Mom alongside Law. But otherwise, he just has a lot of L's going against him. And I really don't mean to hate on Kid, as hard as it may be to believe that. I'm actually a big Kid fan. And so it pains me to say this about the guy. Because I like Kid. I really like Kid. I actually made a video about how he's going to be the one to take Big Mom down. So don't blame me. Blame Kid. He just hasn't learned humility. He just oozes a lot of unmatched confidence. If he's still alive, let's hope he does better and he learns from his mistakes going forward. Because as of now, we are going to have to give him D. D D D D D Kid D D D D D D. Okay, looking at Kaido embodiment. Kaido was a Yonko, had his own army, strongest creature in the world. So definitely had those kingly qualities, those leadership ruler qualities. He also has the high ambition to find One Piece and become the next pirate king, even become Joy Boy at an early estate. Um, and although he did follow Rocks, that's a very different situation to how I assessed Whitebeard following Rocks because Kaido was a lot younger, a lot more impressionable at the time, and his morals and ideals don't match up to Whitebeard's ideals and values. Kaido is another example of one of those ruler by force and power, just by sheer strength, you know, demonstrates the more aggressive qualities of a conqueror in the traditional sense. But then in saying that, he also still does inspire loyalty in quite a number of his followers. You know, King, Jack, a number of his Tobiropo, they were very loyal to him and he inspired them to follow him. I do have to say though, a major point detracted from his embodiment of a ruler and his kingly will is that he did lose his will and he did fall into depression after discovering that he was not Joy Boy and he did fall into this drunken stupor, which I dare say does factor in in bringing down his embodiment points. You know, as a conqueror, again, you have to be resilient. In terms of strength, however, that's another no-brainer. Strongest creature in the world, always bet on Kaido. His introduction says it all, you know, the guillotine blade cracked and the rope snapped. You know, the only reason why he lost at Wano was because, you know, how many different people, how many different groups did he face? And the fact that he was lifting up an entire damn island. And then in terms of his feats as well, he was the youngest member of one of the most legendary crews throughout the series. He became a Yonko. And then he also remained the Yonko despite the fact that they had a meritocratic system, which means that no one was able to defeat him. We should mention that we haven't actually witnessed him in an extended fight against someone in his own tier, in his level. The closest we saw was that brief clash with Big Mom. But still, I think we have enough to confidently say that Kaido definitely deserves the A tier. Next up is the final Yonko of the original group of Yonko, Red Hair Shanks. In terms of embodiment, he's the captain of a Yonko crew. He's another individual where every race follows him. You know, this was made abundantly clear at Elbaf. He's clearly someone that inspires people to follow him as their ruler. And you know, he's feared by everyone. So I think he definitely does display the full range of kingly qualities. In terms of strength, probably the most impressive display of Conqueror's Haki that we have seen in the entire series. It's funny because because it's Roger who was the pirate king. And so it's Roger who is really the ultimate conqueror in terms of the whole world. But when it actually comes to Conqueror's Haki, I don't think anyone embodies it, at least its use of it, more than Shanks. You know, all the hype use of Conqueror's Haki that we have ever seen in the series, whether that be very early in the series in chapter one, or when he uses that crazy Wi-Fi Haki, Shanks has clearly mastered the use of Conqueror's Haki. When it comes to his strength and he comes to his abilities and power knowing that he doesn't have a devil fruit, Shanks is quite literally synonymous with Conqueror's Haki. And so when it comes to feats as well, he's the youngest Yonko. He was the youngest Yonko. Drove off an admiral, was part of the late Pirate King's crew. You could probably even argue that had he gone for the One Piece earlier, we would be reading a very different type of story. And although we don't know what his ultimate end goal 
is, you can clearly see that he is laying out the steps as he needs to. So all in all, Shanks S tier, no doubt about it. Moving on to Zoro, when it comes to his embodiment, we see that he does have grand kingly ambitions in the sense that he has both the ambitions and the will to become the world's strongest swordsman. And he's currently on his way to achieve this, even if he hasn't achieved it yet. He also only follows those who he deems worthy, but it does mean that he has submitted himself under Luffy and he's willing to follow orders from another person, which isn't a dig at Zoro in any way. You know, it just is more of a testament to how great Luffy is. And we have also seen that Zoro himself is a leader in his own way and he also inspires or attracts followers. You know, we see that with Johnny and Yosaku. In terms of strength, he awakened his Conqueror's Haki and then advanced Conqueror's Haki in very quick succession. And I think that immediately qualifies him, you know, in those top tears you know even if he hasn't perfected it necessarily and a lot of its use at Wano wasn't him using it consciously and rather Enma drawing it out of him and also when it comes to strength he is obviously a very proficient swordsman but again he hasn't managed to perfect mastering Enma hasn't made it a black blade yet although I'm sure we can all say that he is very close to achieving this in terms of his feats he defeated a top tier Yonko commander he was instrumental at Rufi piece. Everyone would have died if it wasn't for him blocking their attack. He scarred Kaido and he was the only one able to do so after Odin. Again, achieved advanced Conqueror's Haki. So I think we should confidently say that he is currently at a B tier because he does have quite a lot to go in terms of fulfilling his journey and reaching the heights that he needs to reach, but we will be seeing him get to those higher tiers as the story goes on. And finally, Monkey D. Luffy. When it comes to the embodiment of a conqueror's spirit and of a kingly spirit, Luffy is quite literally the embodiment of will. You know, that unwavering, indomitable spirit. He was the captain of his own crew, now a Yonko crew, a grand fleet. So definitely a leader, definitely a ruler. And again, people are willing to follow him even when he doesn't ask or want them to. You know, he just inspires people to follow him. That's how he acquired the Grand Fleet. And this ability to make friends with anyone and inspire people, that was recognized by Mihawk to be perhaps the greatest skill. And then this is matched in terms of his strength as well because it's crazy because he's so young. But he is super, super strong. Strong enough to be the youngest Yonko now. He's got advanced Conqueror's Haki. We witnessed him split the skies in a Haki clash against Against Kaido, who was already a Yonko and the strongest creature in the world and already an established user who has known how to use advanced Conqueror's Haki. So for Luffy to be able to do that, I mean, that's just wild. In terms of his feats, again, he achieved advanced Conqueror's Haki. He also awakened his Devil Fruit, which we know requires a mastery of your Devil Fruit power. And he defeated Kaido to become the youngest Yonko. And I do think that if you look at what goes in to defeat defeating Kaido, it really is a mix of all three elements, you know, the embodiment of will, that unwavering spirit, you know, no matter the obstacles, despite the fact that Luffy went down, you know, countless of times, he just got back up time and time again, never gave up, never lost sight of his goal. He made sure that he had the strength to be able to achieve this, not just unfounded confidence, but an actual match in his level of strength and his level of power, achieved the level of physical strength that he really needed. Needed to finally defeat Kaido and now we have the youngest Yonko on his way to finding the One Piece and becoming the Pirate King. And so because there is still quite a journey to go and like Zoro he hasn't actually reached all of his achievements yet, my heart says put him at S tier but I will put him at A plus for now. A plus because we know he's reaching S by the end of the series. So Luffy gets a final A tier ranking plus A, A plus, A plus tier ranking. King, and there we have it. So here is my list of Conqueror's Haki users in all of One Piece. You might have noticed that I only included canon characters. So please feel free to use my criteria and let me know your rankings for non-canon characters. Or if you have different opinions on where these characters should sit, then let me know your tier list of Conqueror's Haki users in One Piece. Make sure to subscribe, you know, like, subscribe, do all that fun stuff. Support your girl, your joy girl. Thank you to all of my Patreons and channel members. I really appreciate the support. And thank you to everyone for sitting through this tier list with me. This is Joy Girl, and I'll see you again soon.